Hello and welcome to video lecture number 95. Uh, today we are talking about Days of Rage, 1968 to 1972. Our subsections are Blood in the Streets, the Anti-War Movement and the 1968 Election, the Nationalist Turn, Women's Liberation, and finally Stonewall and Gay Liberation. So the year 1968 was a remarkably eventful and troubled year in U.S. and world history. It began with the election in Czechoslovakia of Alexander Dubček, uh, which began the hopeful but short-lived Prague Spring, and it ended with Apollo 8, a U.S. manned spacecraft successfully orbiting the moon. In between this brief burst of political optimism in the midst of the Cold War, and a spectacular technological achievement, there were student demonstrations uh, from the streets of Paris to the plaza of three cultures in Mexico City, uh, as well as in many U.S. cities. The boldness of the Tet Offensive in Vietnam shocked Americans. Even though it failed militarily, the United States regained all of the ground lost. Uh, Americans were also shocked by the assassinations of Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert F. Kennedy. The most important political event um, of that important year was President Johnson's surprise announcement that he would, in effect, uh, quit the presidency by deciding not to seek re-election, giving in to, to the pressures created by the anti-war movement. This decision was a terrible blow to mainstream liberalism, uh, from which the Democratic Party never fully recovered. Since Franklin Roosevelt's presidency, the Democratic Party had been assertive abroad and reformist at home, a powerful formula that explained three decades of electoral success. But the civil disorder that later marred the Democratic Party's national convention in Chicago symbolized a party that had become deeply divided over the use of military power. Given that the United States was one of two superpowers, with commitments all over the globe, this indecision would prove a major uh, political liability. Moreover, under the leadership of Richard Nixon, the Republican Party seized the issue of national security from the Democrats. It also held to the belief that it was America's special destiny to face threats to liberty. Nixon would go on to win the U.S. presidency only narrowly in 1968, but this victory marked the beginning of the country's conservative reaction to problems at home and abroad. In the meantime, the battle for civil rights had advanced to a second, more complicated stage. Reform triggers reaction, just as the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s generated opposition even as it mobilized support, so did social movements of the 60s and 70s. Diverse groups contested a broad range of issues during this period and beyond. Controversies raged within communities and in political arenas from the local level to the national stage. Uh, the courts, legislatures, executive departments and agencies, uh, and the electorate in referenda were all involved. The environmental and consumer movements met with significant successes um, including federal laws enacted during the Nixon administration. Um, Race-related issues, especially affirmative action and school busing, were fought out in the courts. And in the case of busing, in communities, uh, most bitterly in the northeastern city of Boston, um, this was a big issue. The gay liberation movement and its foes fought over local measures attacking discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, and we will look closer at that also today. So let's dive into Days of Rage, 1968 to 1972, with our first section, Blood in the Streets. The Johnson administration's hopes for Viet Vietnam evaporated when the Viet Cong unleashed a massive assault, known as the Tet Offensive, on major urban areas in South Vietnam. The attack made a mockery of official pronouncements that the United States was winning the war, and it swung public opinion more strongly against the conflict. Anti-war Senator Eugene J. McCarthy's strong showing in the presidential primaries reflected profound public dissatisfaction with the course of the war 
and propelled Senator Robert F. Kennedy into the race on an anti-war platform. On March 31st, 1968, Johnson stunned the nation by announcing that he would not seek re-election. He vowed to devote his remaining months in office to the search for peace, and peace talks began in May of 1968. 1968 also witnessed the assassination of Martin Luther King and its ensuing riots, student occupation of several buildings at Columbia University, a strike by students and labor that toppled the French government, and the assassination of Robert Kennedy, which shattered the dreams of those hoping for social change through political action. The Democratic Party never fully recovered from Johnson's withdrawal and Robert Kennedy's assassination. Our next section then is the anti-war movement and the 1968 election. At the Democratic Convention, uh, the political divisions generated by the war consumed the party. Uh, outside the convention, uh, there were demonstrations, uh, diverting attention from the more serious and numerous activists who came to Chicago as delegates or as volunteers. The Democratic mayor of Chicago, Richard J. Daley, uh, called out the police then to break up the demonstrations. In what was later described as a police riot, Patrolmen attacked protesters at the convention with mace, tear gas, and clubs as TV viewers watched, which only cemented a popular impression of the Democrats as the party of disorder. Democrats dispiritedly nominated Hubert H. Humphrey uh, and approved a platform that endorsed continued fighting in Vietnam while diplomatic means to an end were explored. Richard Nixon, after losing the presidential campaign in 1960 and the California gubernatorial race in 1962, tapped the increasingly conservative mood of the electorate in an amazing political comeback, winning the 1968 Republican presidential nomination and courting what was called the silent majority of law-abiding Americans. George Wallace, a third-party candidate, an independent, uh, skillfully combined attacks on liberal intellectuals and government elites with denunciations of school segregation and forced busing. Nixon offered a subtler, a subtler uh, version of Wallace's populism, adopting what his advisors called the Southern strategy of courting disaffected Southern white voters tired of the civil rights agenda of the Democratic Party. Nixon received 43.4% of the vote to Humphrey's 42.7, defeating him by only 510,000 votes out of the 73 million that were cast. The New Deal coalition of the past 30 years was now broken for the Democratic Party. All right, our next section is the nationalist turn. Vietnam and the increasingly radical youth rebellion intersected with the turn toward nationalism by young African Americans and Chicano activists. Mexican Americans, including Cesar Chavez, marched in Los Angeles in 1970 against the war. The Black Panther Party and the National Black Anti-War Anti-Draft League spoke out against the war as well. Muhammad Ali, the most famous boxer in the world, refused to be inducted in the army. Okay, now let's look at women's liberation. The late 1960s spawned a new brand of feminism, which was called women's liberation. Women's liberation was loosely structured. Uh, the movement went public by protesting at the Miss America pageant in 1968. <clears throat> a national women's strike for equality in August of 1970 brought hundreds of thousands of women into the streets demanding women's equality with men. The terms sexism and chauvinism became new words in American culture. Sisterhood often did not include women of color uh, because they were more focused on the shared struggle of the civil rights movement. Now, women's political uh, mobilization resulted in significant legislative and administrative gains, such as Title IX, of the 1972 Educational Amendments Act, which prohibited colleges and universities that received federal funds 
from discriminating on the basis of sex. Founded by Congresswoman uh, Shirley Chisholm and Bella Abzug in 1971, the National Women's Political Caucus promoted the election of women to public office. In, in 1972, Congress authorized then uh, child care deductions for working parents. Uh, in 1974, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act improved women's access to credit. So there were definite gains made in those arenas. All right, our last section is Stonewall and the Gay Liberation. The vast majority of gay men and lesbians remained, quote, in the closet. Uh, homosexuality was illegal in the vast majority of states. Um, statutes outlawed uh, same-sex relations, and police used other morals laws to harass and arrest gay men and lesbians. In the late 1960s, inspired by black power and the women's movement, gay activists increasingly demanded unconditional recognition of their rights and encouraged people to come out. The new gay liberation found multiple expressions in major cities across the country, but a defining event occurred in New York's Greenwich Village uh, when a local gay bar called the Stonewall Inn was raided by police in the summer of 1969. Its patrons, uh, including gay men, lesbians, transvestites, and transsexuals, rioted for two days. The gay liberation movement grew quickly after Stonewall. Uh, local gay and lesbian organizations proliferated, and activists began pushing for non-discrimination ordinances and consensual sex laws at the state level. By 1975, the National Gay Task Force and several other national organizations lobbied Congress, uh, served as media watchdogs, and advanced suits in the courts. All right, so this concludes our lecture for today, our examination of uh, the Days of Rage from 1968 to 1972. Go ahead and answer those review questions then at this time and continue on with your work.